Good afternoon and welcome everyone from the National Veterans Resource Center based up at Syracuse University. Uh, thank you for joining us today and thank you to, for those who are actually back again with, with us for our third installment in our running webinar series in partnership with the Prevents Task Force. I'm Nick Armstrong and I've had the privilege of leading the research and data analytics team at the IVMF. I'm also a U.S. Army veteran with prior service in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Iraq with the 10th Mountain Division, one of the most deployed Army divisions of our time. So needless to say, figuring out how we can work together to better prevent suicide is both a personal and professional matter for me and for our institute. It's no secret why we're all here. We're here because we're doers and we each have a role to play. And it is our honor at, for us at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse University to partner with the Prevents Task Force to help advance the recommendations set forth in the Prevents Roadmap and to do our part in promoting this public health approach to preventing suicide. If you joined us for either of our past two sessions, we heard from executive leadership from the Prevents Task Force, as well as senior leadership from the VA Office of Suicide Prevention and SAMHSA. First, we heard from Prevents Executive Director, Dr. Barbara Van Dalen, who provided us a detailed overview of the Prevents Roadmap, as well as the newly launched REACH Public Health Campaign, and key information on how you and your organizations can take the first steps. In our second webinar, Dr. Van Dalen is joined by Dr. Richard McKeon and Dr. Matt Miller, Director of VA's Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. Together, they covered a great deal of ground on prevents and agency priorities with states and communities, examples of how states and communities are already engaging and how they're working together across agencies to drive a more coordinated public health approach to preventing suicide at all levels. And if you missed these prior, web, these prior webinars, not to worry, we've recorded them and they're hosted on our website and we're happy to direct you there. This webinar dives a touch deeper. It's a touch more tactical, it's especially tailored for states with active interagency task forces, those looking to better leverage the resources and tools that are available to them. You're going to hear from one more. So here's who I'm going to actually introduce Dr. Barbara Van Dalen to provide a quick overview and some opening remarks. And then we're going to turn it over to our three guest speakers, Mr. Aaron Egan from VA, Ms. Cicely Burroughs McElwain from SAMHSA, and Ms. Liz Barnes from Prevents. And then we're going to do a moderated question and answer period toward the end. Next slide. Just a brief note on the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, for those of you who may not be as familiar with us. Now based at the National Veterans Resource Center, the IVMF is at Syracuse University's Higher Education's first interdisciplinary first academic institute. Play. It is our honor really focused on, excuse me, get a little feedback. Uh, we are the first academic institute singularly focused on advancing the post-service lives of our nation's veterans and their families. As you can see by the map here, we're physically operating in more than a dozen states as well as globally, having served over 140,000 military-connected individuals and serving over 20,000 a year through entrepreneurship training, through in-demand career skills training and credentialing, technical assistance with community approaches to coordination, as well as research and data analytics. Next slide. Uh, and just a brief note, we hope you'll continue to join us in these series uh, for our, our next Prevents Town Hall, uh, which we want to plug here coming up in on November 12th. Here we will reconvene principals from Prevents, VA, and SAMHSA to do a deep dive question and answer period to really dive into the other questions you may have in terms of how you can better action uh, the Prevents Roadmap and all the resources that we have been covering over the last three webinars. Next slide. So now I'd like to introduce Prevents Task Force Executive Director, Dr. Barbara Van Dalen. Dr. Van Dalen was selected to stand up and lead the Prevents Task Force in, in early 2019 upon President Trump signing the Executive Order 13861. In this role, she leads a, a multi-agency national effort to coordinate efforts across government and to build a national strategy focused on improving all, overall mental health to present suicide. She's a licensed clinical psychologist receiving her doctorate from the University of Maryland. She's practiced for over 20 years in the Washington DC area. 
She's well known for being the founder of Given Hour, a national nonprofit that provides free mental health care to those in need, including service members, veterans, and their families. And she's led that organization as president up until 2019. She's also the founder of the Campaign to Change Direction in 2015, a global initiative focused on changing the culture of mental health. She's widely recognized for her work in changing culture associated with, with mental health. She's named to Times Magazine's 2012 list of the 100 most influential people in the world. She's a regular contributor to multiple major media outlets, including Time, Huffington Post, all the major media outlets such as New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Newsweek, and others. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Van Dalen to provide some opening remarks. Thank you, Nick, for that introduction. And um, thank you to everyone who's joined the webinar today. Um, I am very excited that you, about what you're gonna hear as we continue to go deeper into the work that Prevents is doing with our partner organizations. I wanna thank IVMF for putting on this really fabulous webinar series. And it's, so, it's going so well that we're coming back again in November. We had originally planned for three, but what's happened is we've received so many questions from the folks who've been on um, as attendees that we haven't had time to get to all the questions because we're just packing these with so much information. So we decided to do an entire show, an entire town hall. And I'm really excited for November 12th. So please come back, bring your questions so that we can answer um, as best we can. And if not, we'll get more information for you. So thank you to IBMF for doing such a fabulous job to host these. Thank you to um, SAMHSA and VA, two of the primary partners that Prevents works with on a day-to-day -day basis um, to do this work. So for those of you who are new, uh, Prevents is the office that I lead, that this office was stood up as part of the um, signing of the executive order uh, that was signed in March of 2019, the focus of which is to create the first ever all of government, all of nation effort, public health focused effort um, to um, address suicide with a primary focus on our veterans and military families. But in order to do that work, we have to work nationally. We, suicide is a national concern. Um, we've seen an increase in suicide in the last 25 years, 33% increase with some groups um, showing very dramatic increases. Um, our, our young people, suicide is now the second leading cause of death for youth uh, ages 10 to 35. Of course, our veterans, we have been concerned about the numbers that we've seen. There's good news, of course, because of the uh, concerted efforts of the VA and, and many of the organizations that are, are uh, attending as uh, attendees on, on these webinars, um, but we're still very concerned and we, we need to drive those numbers in the other direction. So a key focus of the Prevents work is the state and local efforts. And we are so proud and pleased that so many of you um, and your colleagues in other states have been involved um, in the very uh, fundamental basic way to help us create the actual plan that we are now implementing. We took the first year to build the plan. It was delivered to the president on June 17th of this past summer in the midst of this pandemic that we're living in. And now we're in um, the first phase of implementation that we will, be, we will be doing until June of 22. So I'm, I'm delighted that um, we get to share this information with you. Uh, as I said, today you're gonna hear more of the nitty gritty uh, we look forward to working with those of you who we have not yet worked with. You'll hear about how we're engaged in state visits between now and the end of, of the life of this task force. Um, we look forward to uh, planning state visits with you and your, your organization. Last thing I'd like to say before turning it back over to Nick is a key focus of our work through Prevents is the REACH public health campaign that we launched on July 7th. Thanks to many of you, we already have over 11,000 um, uh, Americans who have signed the Prevents Pledge to REACH. If you don't know about REACH, you'll hear more about it today when my wonderful deputy Liz Barnes talks about the work we're doing in the states. Go to reach.gov, learn about it, share it. 
Those of you who are in states where we have proclamations signed, there are 43 proclamations, prevent proclamations. We want to push out and engage you and your organizations as we work to reach all of those veterans and military families to make sure that they know about resources and receive the help and support that they deserve. So it's an honor to bring this to you. I look forward to coming back on November 12th and answering all the questions that we can fit into that hour-long town hall. So Nick, thank you again, and now I'll turn it back to you. Super. Thanks so much, Dr. Van Dalen. Really appreciate your opening remarks. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Mr. Aaron Eager. Uh, Aaron is the Director of Community-Based Suicide Prevention for the VA's Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. Over the last several years, he's led the implementation of ReachVet, a predictive model in a national clinical care program, and more recently, the launch of a Caring Letters program for the Veterans Crisis Line that will provide more than 90,000 veterans a year with an evidence-based intervention for suicide prevention. He now leads an initiative spreading community-based suicide prevention interventions across the VA system. He has more than 25 years of nursing and healthcare experience and has developed a diverse array of medical, public health, and leadership experience in that time. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Public Health from the University of South Florida. And with that, Aaron, I'd like to turn it over to you for your presentation. Thanks much, Nick, and I'm excited to be here today and talk to this group. Um, let's see, can I get next slide? There we go, and one more. So VA sees our role here really very much as a public health model and what we can do to facilitate work both within VA, but in the communities at the state level and at the national level. Our strategy, the National Strategy for Preventing Veteran Suicide was published a couple of years ago. It's a 10 year strategy available at the link here and it very much aligns with current thinking around suicide prevention and the National Suicide Prevention Strategy. But it's really a two part strategy. VA has good clinical resources focused on mental health and suicide prevention. And we'll talk in a minute about what more we're doing there. But we have a lot of work to do around how we facilitate and support community-based coalitions where this work really gets done for those veterans who are not engaged in VA services. Next slide, please. We talk frequently about suicide as a complex issue and a suicide death not being res the result of a single factor. And this slide really lays out some of the interactions between a variety of domains that can contribute ultimately to suicide. I like this slide because it reinforces something that I spend a fair amount of time on. And if, for those of you who might be familiar with ReachVet, it's a predictive analytics model that we developed and implemented. Um, but I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice when we focus too much on identifying risk in individuals, knowing that risk is really complex and that suicide thoughts and acting on suicide frequently uh, is a very short duration event. The majority of people who act on a suicide impulse do so within an hour of the impulse. So I think we have to be careful when we talk about risk factors to remember that they're not perfect um, and they're, not, they're neither perfectly protective or perfectly risk identification when we're trying to look at large populations of people. Certainly at the individual level, there are things that we associate with risk um, and we do a lot of work clinically to address those, but a lot of these factors here are much more complex and much harder to identify in, a, in an individual. Next slide. So our vision for what we call 2.0 um, of suicide prevention here really is a two-part strategy. The clinical-based interventions are taking some of the work that VA already does and taking the DOD VA clinical practice guidelines that were issued in 2019 and looking at evidence-based therapies for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Those include cognitive behavioral therapy for suicide prevention, dialectical behavior therapy, and problem-solving therapy. 
in our system, we struggle a bit with providing evidence-based therapies consistently for a host of reasons, some of which will resonate, I think, with our community colleagues. And the primary one there is that it's difficult to train clinicians and maintain trained co clinicians in a system where then evidence-based therapies are universally available no matter where that veteran enters care. So our clinical-based interventions here in 2.0 are really about taking what we call clinical resource hubs that are being stood up and providing evidence-based therapies via telehealth modalities as well so that a veteran who seeks care in our system will ultimately be able to access that level of evidence-based therapy no matter where they come in. That's an important advancement for us, and I think it's an important advancement for veterans as a whole as evidence-based therapies have been demonstrated to be able to successfully address suicidal thoughts and behaviors. The other part of this is community prevention strategies where I spend my time here. And this is an overview here, so we'll get into more detail in a minute. But both of these programs are built on a foundation of mental health staffing. For us, we use a ratio of 7.72 per thousand veterans in mental health or in outpatient mental health. We work with our facilities on an ongoing basis to identify where there's gaps in staffing and help them prioritize and fill those gaps. But as all of you know, um, mental health providers are a critical shortage in many areas in our country. I happen to live uh, in a large academic medical center setting in Florida and even here in my community, it's very difficult to find mental health providers in the community that are accepting new patients, even though I have probably some of the best mental health uh, to population ratios in the entire state. So next slide. Um, so this is a little more detail about telehealth initiative. I won't spend a lot of time here except to say this is something that's being stood up now. The evidence-based therapies are listed at the bottom. We're in the process now of implementing these clinical resource hubs within our VISINs, which is our regional structure, and hiring clinicians here. We piloted telehealth for CBISP over the last couple of years successfully and have done a proof of concept there that now allows us to scale that up. So CBISP will be the first of these evidence-based therapies that become available here with DBT and problem-solving therapies um, and safety planning, advanced safety planning coming along as we make more progress here. Next slide. So community-based interventions, why we're all here today. So VA sees this as an opportunity really to take the work that's being done at the national level in the governor's challenge states and our facilities that have already been doing community outreach and education through our suicide prevention coordinators, pull in a model that some of you may be familiar with called Together with Veterans, which is in 20 communities or so, uh, and is a veteran peer-to-peer -peer model that we do and bring VA resources to bear to really help communities facilitate this work. We know that communities uh, and public health infrastructure nationally is challenged. As Nick mentioned, I come from a public health background and we have strong groups working on this, but there's not in most cases dedicated FTE devoted to this work. So our community engagement and partnership coordinators will serve the role of being able to help take state level governor's challenge work together with veterans, VA resources, and bring them to communities and help the communities engage, use a model that helps identify community priorities and resources and barriers, and really facilitate that work. We're acutely aware that it's not VA work in the community, it's community work. But we think it's important that we provide the resources that we can, in this case FTE, to supporting that work as it gets done. An example here is for a lot of the Governor's Challenge teams, lethal means is a priority there. And I think we can go to the next slide. We'll talk to this. OK. 
Okay, this is our, our partnership slide and Cicely's gonna talk more about Governor's Challenge and Mayor's Challenge, so let's go to the next one. And one more, come back to that, there we go. So these priority areas, at least the three bolded ones here are part of Governor's Challenge as well. They're part of our community-based interventions for suicide prevention model. An example of the state work coming down to the community level is lethal means safety. Um, in the resource slides that follow my presentation, we have a partnership with AFSP, the American Foundation for Shooting Sports and others on a lethal means firearms safety toolkit that can be used in communities. So if for a state that wants to take on this work, the CEPCs can really help that state team engage in communities and talk to gun shops or other organizations in the community to help bring them to the table here. We think that's an important resource and one that we look forward to continuing to work with folks on. This model for us right now is active in Vision 23, which is upper Midwest, um, Minnesota, uh, parts of Iowa, but also has now been stood up and we are hiring in Visions 4, 9, and 12. So 4 is the Pennsylvania area, 9 is Tennessee and Kentucky, and 12 is also Midwest, Illinois. Um, and parts of some of the surrounding states. We're going to add another six to seven visions, which will bring another 10 plus states online in January of this year, so that the CEPCs and our model becomes available and starts to pick up that community coalition work and bring the governor's challenge work down. So here are some examples of how we prioritize some of these things. Identifying veterans and ask the question is a key component. It's hard to provide services for veterans when we're not necessarily doing a consistent job of identifying veterans in our communities. And suicide risk screening has become an increasing um, important entry point to healthcare. Many of you may be aware that VA is integrated universal screening across all of our settings. Many states are starting to think about how they implement this in their governor's challenge teams. Connectedness and care transitions. Um, connectiveness we think of as an important protective factor, but certainly lack of that connectiveness as a risk factor as well. There's lots of interesting efforts underway there to explore how you do that. Caring contacts is near to and dear to my heart. We know that there's a good evidence base for caring letters post inpatient discharge for people who have survived a suicide attempt. In VCL, we're doing it in a program now centrally so that callers who call the Veterans Crisis Line and then are identified will be enrolled in a caring letters program over the course of a year. Um, but it's also challenging to do. So we're working with communities to think about how can you do this in various ways to take the evidence-based caring contacts and implement that more broadly so that more people are receiving the benefit. And then lethal means safety and safety planning. We touched on lethal means. Safety planning, again, is an evidence-based intervention for at-risk individuals, something we do in our system and it happens to varying degrees across other systems, but it's uh, an opportunity, I think, to do more with at-risk individuals and something we're working to support more broadly across communities so that providers begin to understand how to do safety planning um, and the benefit of doing it. Next slide. Great. So these are some examples from some of our state teams in the Governor's Challenge work. Team Pennsylvania um, is integrated, asked the question, and it's important to note here, it's have you ever served? This group, I'm guessing, is pretty aware of why we ask that question versus are you a veteran, but the evidence has been clear for a while that many groups, particularly many at risk or, or groups of concern, don't always identify as being veterans. So we think asking have you ever served is a better way to identify a broader group of folks who do, um, who have served in our armed forces. And then we've seen a number of campaigns, including people picking up the Prevents Reach campaign now, but um, to increase 
military cultural competence, to increase communications as a whole about suicide prevention efforts. Arizona has a really strong program called Deconnected that's been around for a long time that does a great job connecting um, support and resources there. Montana has been an interesting group to work with and one of my colleagues is our former suicide prevention coordinator there. They've had great success with getting state funding and legislation to move things like rapid actionable surveillance forward and now crisis units and screening and a peer support program. Los Angeles is now doing many of these same things there. So we're really starting to see a lot of this work bear fruit in the states and in larger communities, but there's lots of opportunity to continue to move forward there. All right, next slide, and I am almost done here. There we go, and one more. So there's a number of resources here that are available to you. Um, as VA, we're, we're really trying to look hard at what we can provide to communities to get this work done. We know money is a big deal uh, and grant funding is something all of our agencies are working on. But there are some things right now I think that we bring to the table that are worth considering. There's several in this deck here um, that I'll let you look at. But this one I wanna mention because I think it's an important one and one that I've been involved with since the beginning. So it's something I'm proud of. And that's our risk management consult program. We have a center in the Rocky Mountain, Myrek, uh, which is one of our mental illness uh, resource centers that provides risk management, suicide risk consults to providers. We got special permission to offer this to community providers as well as obviously VA providers. And they don't do individual case reviews. So their objective is not to help you review an individual chart and make decisions about that specific veteran but they do a great job helping conceptualize risk, look at chronic versus acute risk, think about how to have productive conversations about lethal means that result in good safety plans and good plans for addressing lethal means concerns, how to engage veterans and keep them engaged, particularly for those at high risk. Um, and then one of the most important things that they've added is postvention resources. We know that losing a veteran, losing a patient to a provider to suicide can be really devastating. And the Myrick team is there and has a great depth of experience. We do this now for all of our VA providers. We proactively reach out to them after a death in our system to offer postvention. But it's a really important resource for providers. Um, who may struggle to work through some of the feelings when they lose someone to suicide. And with that, I'm going to pause and hand this back to you, Nick. Thanks so much, Aaron. Very helpful. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Ms. Cicely Burroughs McElwain. Cicely currently serves as the Military and Veterans Affairs Liaison for SAMHSA, where she focuses her efforts on strengthening cross-agency collaboration between the VA, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the, and the DOD in meeting the behavioral health needs of, of SMVF. Prior to con her current position, she served as a public health advisor in SAMHSA's Center for Mental Health Services, National Child Traumatic Express Traumatic Stress Initiative as the network's Military Families Government Liaison. She has over 20 years of experience working in rural behavioral health systems at local, state, and federal systems. Prior to joining the team at SAMHSA, she served as a clinical social worker for the VA Capital Healthcare Network at the VA Maryland Healthcare System. She received her Master of Social Work from the University of Maryland, Baltimore with a specialized focus in clinical services and, and human services administration. She's also an adjunct le lecturer uh, for Salisbury University's social work department, uh, and, as well as being a, a member of the George W. Bush Institute's inaugural class of the Stand Two Veterans Leadership Program. With that, I'd like to welcome Cicely. Thanks so much, Nick, and thanks to Barbara and Aaron and everyone on the line today for joining. It's exciting to see so many familiar names across the country um, that have been engaged in the work that both SAMHSA, VA, and our partners at Prevents uh, have been working on for so long. 
So let me just get to the next slide and dive in about where we are going and what this work really means to us here at SAMHSA and how we hope that your communities will engage if you haven't already. Next slide. So on the left side of your screen, you're gonna see where we're at now. And on the right side of your screen, you're going to see our aspirational approach of reaching all 50 states uh, with the Governor's Challenge work. We started with a very kind of grassroots level work engaging cities and counties and realized that we needed the infrastructure that comes along with having statewide executive leadership buy-in to do this work. And so if you are not part of the seven original states, the 20 states that added into this challenge from last year, please know that we will be engaging your leadership within your community very shortly over the next several years to get you in purple beside us. Next slide. So this work is really critical, as so many of you know, and when we talk about communities and how we're engaging communities, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to break down to the fundamental building blocks today. Many of you know this process because you've either done this work with SAMHSA as a state partner from a community side outside of the military and veteran space, or you may be engaged or know of other communities that have started to engage. But one of the critical reasons that VA came to SAMHSA and decided to, to work with us on a policy academy model was because they recognized what this level of engagement can do within a community and a state system. And we always start with building off of those fundamental foundational documents that you see here. To your left, you have the national strategy for preventing suicide that VA has put out, their plan for the 10 years that really does give you those 14 areas that allow folks to identify and understand the VA's public health approach. On the right is our CDC partners within the umbrella of HHS that work together with folks at VA and other agencies to create the technical package of policy programs and practices on preventing suicide. When SAMHSA was looking at the best approach to move forward, we consulted with so many of the experts in the field and we knew that we needed to find a way that communities can make this tangible and taking those documents and working to create kind of this foundational framework <laughs> in which these seven strategies from CDC and the national strategies uh, that come from both the national plan and VO's own plan would allow to come together and kind of weave into this comprehensive approach. So why do we do this? Next slide. We do this because we know focusing on the small stuff matters. So Erin, thank you for letting me steal a little piece of your slide earlier, where we really talk about how we can get those left side activity bubbles engaged in a way that are meaningful for our communities. We know at the very beginning of things that over half of our veterans don't go to VA for care or for all of their care for one reason or another. And we know that more than half of Americans well more than half of Americans do not go to care for the needs that they have related to any mental illness or substance use disorders. We can even climb up with SUVs into the 80 plus um, percentage of people not in care. And that really does make a difference for us when we're thinking about people struggling that just maybe not realize about the access and the services that are out there. And we always agree that one death is too many when it comes to losing individuals within our families and our communities. Next slide. So we've been together on this webinar for a little over half an hour, and this is the time where I'm gonna re-engage your brains and your hearts and your minds. So I assume, hopefully, that you are somewhere near a window right now. And if you are lucky enough to be working in a workspace where there's a window and you can peek out that window, what are you seeing? You're seeing a community that's ripe and waiting for you to engage. You have an expertise that comes along with the jobs and the passions and the experiences that you bring into this work. And in our process in engaging states through governor's challenge and cities and communities within the mayor's challenge work, we've recognized that that value added component, those resources, which may not at this moment include grant dollars, but do include technical assistance and resources in collaborating and bringing people together using this comprehensive model, really does make a difference. And so I oftentimes will get those questions about where do we get started? How do we figure this out? And I always tell folks to just start by looking out their own window. 
Do you know where the veterans are in your own community? Do you know how to identify and connect to the resources that may be existing or how to figure out those resources that aren't there? And these are the processes that we walk state teams through as we engage them in their process with the governor's challenge model. Next slide. So SAMHSA for many years has been in the business of doing coalition building. If you are familiar with CADCA and the work that goes on within our substance use prevention work, you may already know about the strategic prevention framework. And you may or may not know that this same framework is exactly what SAMHSA's service member veterans and their families technical assistance center turned to when we started to create kind of the outline of the efforts that we take on when we engage states and communities in a policy academy process. So we're just gonna break this down for just a few minutes and then dive into kind of getting you guys thinking about how you can make action. There's five components to the actual framework itself. They're kind of straightforward. You can read them on your screen, assessment, capacity building, uh, planning, implementation, and evaluation. This beautiful pedal that you see to your side is really supposed to be something that is kind of a continual process of improvement model. And through all of that, there are really two cross-cutting principles that we want folks to integrate, which are one, being culturally competent, which is where we actually come into play with having a service member and veterans focused technical assistance center, and two, looking at sustainability. So creating whatever group or vessel that you can create to do this work for suicide prevention requires that it be somewhat flexible, not so rigid that should things dry up when it comes to funding streams or resources that you guys have to shrivel up and not actually be sustainable. And all of that work comes down to wanting to ensure that folks understand that it is not easy to take ideas and get them into action. In fact, the governor's challenge process takes a minimum of two years to go through all of the steps that we outline. The first you're doing an academy, the next you're doing implementation academy work, and then the rest of your lives doing this amazing effort to continue to save lives in your own local communities. And it sounds like a big commitment because it is, but it's worth it. Next slide. So four key takeaways, just to give people an idea, make sure that you have your personal commitment in place because you have this ability to take a role in saving lives. When we look at our public health approach, there's not a hard job to figure out where you can fit it. And it allows us to understand that very small sliver of this effort on this continuum of care requires master's level, clinical level knowledge that um, can save lives. We now know that when we go much wider and upstream, that there's a lot more that folks can do in taking care of their own family members, their community members, their neighbors, and so on. So after you've made that commitment to figure out your place, take time to educate yourself because all of us know who are connected to our military and veteran populations that just because we know one Marine doesn't necessarily mean we know all of them. And just because we know an amazing female veteran who served doesn't mean that we understand exactly what her colleague in arms also went through. And that data is at your fingertips. A big part of the success of these teams that are going on right now is making sure that the teams have access to free trainings in military and veteran cultural competency. So that's an easy step that folks could take at their fingertips. Next, identify who your community partners are in this work. If you are not sure in your own local engagement area who you should be connecting with, he don't hesitate to call SAMHSA and the SMVFTA Center. We can make sure we get you connected to those individuals that have that same passion for this suicide prevention efforts uh, as you do right now and then contribute your knowledge to this work any way you can. Next. So how can we help? We can help by making sure you're aware of SAMHSA Service Member Veterans and Their Families Technical Assistance Center. Yes, it's a mouthful, but it's an important one. Uh, the SMVFTA Center link is available for you within the slide deck and we can make sure folks have access to that. We also want you to know that there's that data component, that huge kind of access uh, an understanding and assessment stage that can be helped through SAMHSA's NISDA data portal, as well as the amazing data resources at VA. And then also when it comes to sustainability and flexibility, we do have a whole webpage that gives grants forecasting on what SAMHSA is putting out there with your federal tax dollars through the SAMHSA.gov slash grants page or the federal website, grants.gov. All of this work together really is just to share with you that 
the states that have engaged in this process have been successful. Between baby steps and huge leaps forward, they've been able to really identify ways that they personally could take on those three core priority areas, which are actually six, but it makes it feel more doable and achievable when you look at them as three. And making sure that you are able to identify others like you who are like-minded and have those resources and knowledge to do this work and save lives locally. So we're here to answer questions after we hear from our amazing partners at Prevents. And thank you again to all of you and especially IVMF for allowing us to share today. Thank you, Cicely, for that. Uh, I'd like to introduce our third speaker now, uh, Ms. Liz Barnes who serves as the Acting Deputy Executive Director for the Prevents Task Force, uh, involved in developing and implementing the first federally coordinated national public health strategy and roadmap to address veteran suicide. Uh, prior to taking this role, Ms. Barnes served as the Director for Policy and Plans of the Department of Defense Suicide Prevention Office. She's also held numerous positions for the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, uh, focused on personnel policy, human resources, and congressional affairs, She's also selected to assist the department's implementation of the recommendations coming out of the Military Compensation Retirement Modernization Commission. She's a U.S. Army veteran. Uh, she served as a, an Army officer for nine years in the Ordnance Corps and Adjutant General Corps, uh, held a num number of uh, assignments at the installation Army staff and National Guard Bureau levels. She's also an incredibly active volunteer. Uh, she's a volunteer uh, hotline and classroom trainer supporting the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline uh, supporting Northern Virginia. Uh, she helped establish and co-leads a suicide bereavement support group, uh, filling a gap in service for suicide loss survivors uh, ages uh, 18 to 24 years in the, in the greater DC area. Uh, she is also the, uh, the board chair for a, a private nonprofit called PRS Incorporated, uh, which exists at individuals living with mental illness, substance use disorders, mild intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorders, and anyone who faces life crises can achieve safety, personal wellness, recovery, and community integration. She holds a bachelor's degree from McDaniel College in sociology, a master's degree from Georgetown uh, in human resource management, and is working toward her doctorate uh, at Vanderbilt in leadership and learning organizations. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Liz. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, we are so excited to be able to wrap in um, all of the other webinars that we've had with Dr. Van Dalen, uh, with SAMHSA and VA SPP partners. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this series. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, as Dr. Van Dalen has mentioned in previous webinars, the Prevents Roadmap has 10 overarching recommendations. Um, we also, Prevents has an entire state and local engagement strategy of which the state site visits are a core component. But today, we really wanna delve deep into the state site visits as well as the four main activities we plan to achieve with each one of them, as you see here. And then I'll delve into each one of them on the follow on slides. Next slide, please. So the Prevents Roadmap has highlighted special populations that are vital to engage and partner with. And as you see in the, the pictures here and, and the different communities, uh, it's so important that we hear from the leaders within the faith-based communities, those first responder communities, uh, the state and local government, as well as the nonprofit organizations, not just the national ones, but it's so important to be able to hear the state and local community nonprofit organizations, as well as the vet veteran and military communities, as well as the Native American communities. Uh, and what we know from this is one state, uh, faith-based or first responder community is going to be so different than another state. So it's really important that we're able to hear from you all, as well as the critical role that it plays with us being able to link together each one of our state visits. Uh, we've so far visited uh, seven states. Uh, we had five of them in person, and now uh, we've been doing them virtually due to COVID. Uh, and we are looking forward to visiting Montana and Nevada going forward and look forward to meeting with each one of your states. Now I'm going to go a little bit in more detail about the goals that we plan to achieve with each one of our site uh, visits. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, the Prevents Roadmap recommendations have corresponding agency actions that were truly 
really written for the federal agencies when you look at the actual roadmap. But when we were writing them, we really wanted to look at the goal that state and local communities uh, entities could use them as well. So how do we then translate those recommendations and the agency actions down? And so to be able to do this, we have to partner with the states. We need to listen to your, all feed, your feedback, as well as uh, just have an understanding of what you all are doing in the states. And part of that, like one example is, um, when we're looking at what are your prioritization with your state, with what you're doing with suicide prevention efforts. Uh, also, where are the political will to execute the recommendations within the roadmap? And uh, are the is the state ready to implement uh, many of the recommendations that we have? Another is what resources or policy changes are needed down at your state to prioritize the province roadmap recommendations. Some examples of that are what data assets do you need? Uh, what type of grants do you need? Uh, what training is needed as well as any policy changes? That way we can then consolidate it together and then work with the other federal agencies within the task force. And then with each one of these slides, you'll then see this state site action, uh, visit action. What we are hoping to do is that's what we want to, to gain from you all when we're going down to meet with you. Next slide, please. So the second primary goal is to use the state visits to learn from the states of what the best practices are that those states are already doing as they pertain to the prevents roadmap. And then what are the best ways that prevents can share this information? So if you think about uh, many of the efforts that you all are doing, our goal is to be able to collect this information, the best practices, but also being able to amplify and expand your best practices. And so to do so, it requires us coming down to listen to the states on how best to receive the information, what are you all currently doing, putting it into a rep repository, and then being able to share that when we go to other state visits. Uh, one prime example of that, that we share is with the uh, first responder community. We were able to learn in, in New York City that uh, the first responders, uh, when uh, an officer had uh, suicide ideation, their practice and their policy was to take their badge as well as their firearm. Well, then they rewrote that policy and now they only take away their firearm and the officer is still uh, allowed to maintain their badge. That was so important to that community and the amount of stigma that was then reduced. So sharing ideas like that in different policies or procedures uh, throughout the state visits. Additionally, uh, we're looking at not only telling the states what the province roadmap is about, but also having these interactive sessions across the states so we can start compiling how the states execute the four areas uh, mentioned on this slide here and what are some opportunities for us to streamline processes and communication between the states, the federal agencies, as well as minimize the duplication and expanding the impact of the individual state efforts. And the next slide, please. And then the third and fourth goals are to keep the state visits from just being just another meeting where we talk about the problem and how great it would be if we would have somebody that can execute the solutions. But what prevents, we wanna work with each one of the states to develop meaningful partnerships and collaborations that will enable you all to implement and evaluate the prevents roadmap recommendations relevant to your specific state. In addition, we want to work with the states to leverage the Prevent Roadmap Recommendation data system to provide the states with data that is needed to implement and evaluate their suicide prevention activities. So when we've been meeting with the state so far, we've been bringing in academia, as well as any of the data analytics and the data systems that you all have in place. And we're consolidating that into, I, I'd like to call it a map. And, and our goal with this map is to be able to, as mentioned, amplify and enhance the existing data that you are have and how do we share that throughout the nation. And then finally, uh, Prevents wants to be able to uh, share valuable federal resources beyond data. And one example of that is with the REACH campaign that I know that you've heard a lot about. And so we did want to take an opportunity here to show you, if you go to next slide please, uh, show you a little bit about our REACH campaign. Uh, with that, we're going to show a short video in just a second. Uh, but this is one of our images with our REACH campaign. If you could go to the next slide. And then we're going to play a short video.
Great, thank you so much. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, and if you uh, if it have been part of the webinars prior to this, you would have seen that we had wearewithinreach.net. We have now transitioned over to reach.gov. So please take a look at our website. You'll see uh, many toolkits uh, as well as different resources. So please uh, visit our website and please also take the pledge to reach. As Dr. Van Dalen mentioned earlier today, we've had over 11,000 uh, people that have taken the pledge to reach. So please uh, take a look at our website. Um, and then the last thing is uh, when kind of wrapping all of this together is uh, one of the questions that has been out there is what is the difference between prevents, uh, SAMHSA, VAs, uh, governor's challenge and mayor's challenges. And just uh, to wrap this all together is how prevents is continually collaborating in tandem with the governor's challenge. And this was actually occurring before the roadmap was even published back in June. Uh, we meet regularly with SAMHSA as well as uh, VA's suicide prevention program. And uh, part of this is even each uh, time there is a governor's challenge meeting and uh, academy, we're part of that. And so it's imperative that all three of us are continually talking that we're not duplicating any efforts, but yet we're always amplifying and enhancing each, each, uh, each program's efforts. And next slide. Nick, it's back over to you. Great. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so now we've got uh, some time here to walk through a number of questions that we've we've uh, received from folks who've been a part of these uh, webinars over the last uh, several weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we also have some some uh, a Q and A bar in the in the Zoom itself. So if we have, I know we have a, a few questions that have come in, but if there are other questions, please feel free to to add to those. Um, uh, a number of the questions that we've pulled together that actually our, our panelists have uh, have hit on, uh, Liz just just now talked about uh, some of the implementation questions around the connection between prevents as well as how VA and SAMS are working through these uh, the, the governor's challenge itself. Um, I'll actually just kind of start with the top. One of the most important questions you know for our audience is particularly around crisis intervention. Uh, and maybe I'll kick this over to to Aaron in particular. I know both Aaron and Cicely had a, a handful of slides that uh, were highlighting different uh, uh, resources uh, available to folks. And so uh, maybe maybe we could just touch on what you know what should I do if someone tells me they are thinking about suicide? Uh, and the question below that really gets into you know, those who may not be may not have access to to VA care. Uh, through eligibility requirements or or connections to local providers, uh, what are some of the resources or tools that uh, they, they might uh, uh, leverage? Aaron, you want to take that? Sure. Um, you know, it, it's contextual. I think, first of all, save training for people is a great way to have basic skill set about how do you deal with somebody talking about thinking about suicide or a plan to act on suicide. You know, even as clinicians, um, certainly I'm a nurse by background, we don't necessarily get training on how to deal with somebody in crisis or is suicidal. It's, um, it's not my background. I've come to this over the last five years or so or gotten and gotten a lot more comfortable with the conversation. I think this question is, is simple but also complex because it depends on a whole lot of factors and the way I would deal with it is not the way most um, in the community would deal with it. So I think ultimately both for both of these, your ultimate objective is to get the person and keep them safe. So I think somebody saying that they've thought about suicide is different than saying that they're thinking about suicide is different than somebody who has an active plan and has developed resources to actually act on their plan. But all of them um, really come down to recognizing what your comfort level is and then asking for help. In a community that has VA resources, I, you know, I'd like to think that looks very different, but the reality is it's very much community dependent. A lot of communities now are embedding mental health professionals with law enforcement teams. I think that is a huge step towards 
having better outcomes for folks when we do call 911. But 911 is the appropriate resource in many cases to deal with somebody who is actively suicidal and you aren't in a position to professionally interact with them. Cicely, I saw you nodding along, so I'm going to hand to you and see what you'd have to offer. Thanks so much, Erin. Yeah, and thanks, Nick, for that shout out back to the slides. Um, one thing I did highlight that I think is really important is for folks to be aware of the behavioral health treatment locator, um, the, the findtreatment.gov or findtreatment.samhsa.gov link um, is really important because you can type in a zip code or an, an area that you're looking for treatment um, and be able to find local resources that way. I absolutely agree with Erin that unfortunately, Fortunately, unfortunately, our current system really does still rely on 911 when it comes to that kind of level of intervention. However, um, those simple three digits are also coming to us soon, uh, hopefully with the uh, implementation of the three digit uh, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number two. So uh, the, the VCL, of course, those hotlines, those are staffed with professionals that can assist for immediate um, needs. I also love the fact that SAMHSA has taken up the banner of uh, mental health first aid and with the help of the National Council of Veterans Mental Health First Aid. So for folks that feel like you need a little more training and how to help loved ones who may be at risk, there's some really great uh, low cost, no cost trainings that can also help that again, don't require that clinical degree that just give you the skills you need to deal with the crisis at hand. And especially for any of us, you know, one in five, and I think that number's closing, closing in on two in five of us across the nation live with uh, a, a diagnosable mental illness in our lifetimes. And so we want to make sure that people think of this just like they would with CPR. If you know how to save a life with that way or the Heimlich maneuver, the same thing is needed in our toolbox when it comes to saving lives for a mental health crisis as well. Excellent. I realize, Cicely, I, I didn't say, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, the foundational principle for everyone around suicide is people don't die by suicide because we talk to them about it. So if you're talking with somebody who's talking about thinking about suicide, you're not going to prompt them to act because you ask them about what their thoughts are or ask them to tell you more about what's going on. That's, that's, um, that's not always easy to internalize and remember, but it's really important. Terrific. Liz, I don't know if you have anything to add there. I know you're uh, an active hotline crisis worker. Anything, any thoughts? No, I, I think that uh, my colleagues uh, hit, it, hit it perfectly and, and just know that uh, please reach out. Uh, we have resources on our reach.gov uh, website, so please take a look at that. Uh, but also call uh, the Veterans Crisis Line, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and uh, there are people there to help you. And uh, even if you're either yourself struggling or worried about somebody else, please reach out. Great. Uh, moving down to the next cluster of questions around implementation, I know we get a lot of questions uh, around uh, the website, so please take a look at I know we get a lot of questions around funding. Um, you know, maybe kicking this over to, back to Aaron. You know, what what is available? Um, you know, for for communities to to look at, and you know, to the second question in particular, like what other types of resources should be should communities be leveraging? And we can we can kick that around the horn. Yeah, I'm going to kick that first one right back to Cicely because she's the expert here. <laughs> Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about resources, but maybe we'll take the first one first. Okay, sure thing. So anyone who wants to know about, let's start small and go bigger, SAMHSA in particular funding opportunities, we get both block grant and discretionary grants that come through this uh, agency known as the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, SAMHSA.gov slash grants is the best place to go. I would highly recommend individuals sign up for what we call our grants forecast. So from year to year, depending on the appropriations from Congress, we never know what exactly may be coming down the pike. Um, and we want folks to be able to be notified by eblast as soon as they are able to, um, you know, be on the streets, so to speak. When those grant announcements hit the streets, oftentimes windows for response are very short. So uh, checking those out is important. 
grants.gov is that full federal umbrella of grants where you can search by name and keyword to find out a whole host of grant programs that may be related to the specific type of work that your organization or your coalition wants to do together. Um, even uh, in this latest round of CARES Act funding, there was specifically, as Dr. McKeon mentioned, on uh, Prevents 201 installation of this uh, webinar series, uh, about 50 million new dollars for states to support their suicide prevention efforts. And so that's really critical. And then for that secondary piece, um, where are those resources to support your state specific communities? Uh, SAMHSA not only has the military veteran focused resource in the work of the uh, SMVFTA Center, we also have the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and we coordinate both the uh, Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention as well as the federal working groups. So there's a lot of great free uh, federally vetted resources out there that you can find at those websites that are also on that resource slide. Uh, back to you, I'm throwing to Liz. Yeah, no, we, uh, everything that Cicely said, uh, we're really excited. Part of the, if, if uh, you all go to um, the Prevents uh, VA website, uh, we do have the supplemental materials for the roadmap. And you'll see in there that we have a grant proposal. Uh, so please take a look at that. And, and we are actively working with the task force uh, to be able to stand up a Prevents grant program as well. Uh, but please take a look at, at every, all the resources that Cicely mentioned. And I will jump in on the last part here and just say, you know, there's a question about high, uh, higher per capita rates. You know, I think we have to be a little careful. This goes back to my comments early on about risk. You know, rates are, are standardized to a base population, typically 100,000. So you see a fair amount of variation in rates between states. But ultimately, we're talking about individuals who die by suicide. And those individuals, that count of deaths is a function both of the rate and the veteran population. So Montana, for instance, has higher rates, but a relatively small veteran population. We're still concerned about veterans in Montana, but I do think you just have to be careful to think in terms of both. And we typically look at rates and both counts because for instance, a state like California, whose rate isn't as elevated, has a really huge veteran population. So ultimately has more veterans who die by suicide than many smaller states with higher rates. It's, so it's a little more complex. Um, and important, I take this question as, you know, understanding the population as a whole, and Cicely gave some great resources, our veteran report, um, that we do on deaths is a good resource. The DOD reports are a great resource, but ultimately there's lots of good data that out there, demographic data that you can look at that gives you both veteran population. We're working on something that will share this more easily with states as well, but looks at demographic data, employment data, housing and homelessness data that really helps you get a better feel for communities and where their focus areas might be. Excellent. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just moving along, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between these questions and the questions that have been posed in the Q&A section, just as they, as, they, as they sort of bridge off of what we're discussing. Maybe the I don't know, Cicely, you see this question from Jill, what were the three easy things we can do again? Uh, I think that bridges off of this thread. So yeah, actually I had four, um, which is great that you were asking so we can take those away. It was really to commit, learn, identify and contribute, um, really making your personal commitment to join this process and in, in, uh, contributing. Um, learning about cultural competency efforts. Um, so we have a lot of great free resources, that SAFE course that Erin mentioned. Um, we have some really amazing resources from uh, non-federal partners, but also from federal partners within um, the CDP course and other resources out there uh, from Purdue. And then also making um, a step to actually, you know, start that work and identifying who those key partners are that you should be working with and then ultimately contributing to the process itself. Excellent, thank you. A couple questions here from Tim that I think bridge into our next uh, group around structure and operations, operational questions. Uh, one with, one res with respect to uh, some pending legislation, but 
I think one of the one of the pieces of that too is maybe we could talk a bit about how uh, how you are all working together to continue to streamline how state and local uh, organizations and governments and community organizations are 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 working across both Prevents VA and SAMHSA. Sure, and I can I could start that off. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll first like focus in with with communities. Um, and so the Prevents Roadmap was created using a public health approach. So meaning the strategies will impact not just veterans but all Americans. And so by using this approach that prevents can reach the veterans that may not be accessible through the typical channels, right? We know that not all veterans are connected with VA services. So it's imperative that we're partnering with, with SAMHSA as well to reach the entire community. Um, and so with that, uh, with communities prioritize and activities recommended in the Prevents Roadmap. There are things that Cicely has already talked about, suicide prevention training across all professions that interact with persons at higher risk for suicide or at crisis points, such as how can we start training? We, you know, we hear about gatekeepers, but how can we look at other folks like bank tellers, lawyers, uh, you know, different folks that are working in the gym? You know, how do we then get that training out to not just the clinical professionals, but all Americans? Um, and those will then uh, assist the service members, the veterans, their family members. And that I think is part of the beauty of, of this relationship and how we can look at the Prevents Roadmap down to that state and local community area. But then the second part is with consumers is the prevents team is engaging with we've been uh, engaging with consumers since day one. We have a significant amount of partnerships right now that we're working with organizations, as well as we have ambassadors uh, at a national level. Uh, we have the SAMHSA regional ambassadors, and then we are also working with uh, developing a state ambassador program. And uh, even with working with the specific veterans, uh, we asked for a veteran survey. We had it through the month of September, and we actually received about 20,000 responses to a veteran survey to then, how do, we, how do we know how you're connected? And then how can we then take this data to help enhance programs going forward? And then the last thing is when we want, we want to continue to hear from veterans of what priorities uh, that they are experiencing, uh, what do they need to, for, with any type of help, and in particular, what can we do to help with the effects of COVID? And, uh, and I think together with SAMHSA and Suicide Prevention Program, we have this opportunity right now to truly impact that. I will kick it over to Cicely or Aaron. So Erin, uh, I'll jump in and then I'll throw to you. I think the thing that is really clear to me from the get-go of this executive order was that um, the voices of experts, and by experts I mean our military veterans and their families, were at the table for this work. And so um, the real relationship building started pre-roadmap and continued because at that time when the executive order came out, we had already engaged with seven states in the governor's challenge and some of our cities um, for the mayor's challenge work. And there was such great foresight to say to those communities, what have you learned in this process? Um, being able to sit on some of those working groups along families who had lost, lost loved ones and had, had survivors, we recognized the need for that continual kind of input loop to happen. And prevents leadership now um, with Liz and Barbara continue to do that work. So every time they're going into a state, they engage us and say, do you have a challenge state or do you have contacts? We are allowed to share insights and in, 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 in kind of innovations um, that our state communities have been doing so that then prevents can learn from those and share uh, back. And then when prevents goes to states where we're not yet, they're able to come back to us and share. Our, we have had some great examples in the 43 straight states that have done proclamations. So many of them have come back and said, hey, in our proclamation, we noticed it said we should support the governor's challenge or like, likewise efforts. And what can we do to engage? So really there's a symbiotic relationship there in us needing them and them needing us and all of us needing a, a unified national approach to suicide prevention, which I think, you know, definitely is kind of finding its new path forward using the roadmap. So Aaron, I'll throw to you. You guys covered it. I got nothing. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you're both, you're both calling out 
I know sometimes states have, have asked questions about how this all works together. You know, the reality is a lot of us at every level have been doing this work for a while and prevent now creates lots of opportunities to focus national attention as a as a national call to action around suicide. And it just creates more opportunities to bring resources for some of those states uh, or some of those VA facilities and visions for me that you know, have lots of different priorities. This just helps reaffirm that suicide is a national issue and something that we all need to focus on. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, Aaron, I completely agree. You know, and I'm, I'm coming over from the Department of Defense and where the entire universe revolved around the Department of Defense. And then now I think prevents, you know, having the 11 other federal agencies as part of this task force and looking at what data systems are out there just at a federal level, but imagine then looking down at the state and local area and starting to interweave all of them together. And I think that's where we have this opportunity and system everything that you said. We started this work, you know, prior to the roadmap being released. And it's so imperative that uh, all three of our organizations are working in tandem to be able to implement this to truly change uh, suicide for the nation writ large. Yeah, and if I could just jump back in. Uh, sometimes I'll get states that ask me, uh, do we need to do the prevents proclamation if we're already a governor's challenge state? My default is yes. If you're a prevent state and you haven't done governor's challenge and we send you an invitation to your governor, we would hope that the default would be yes. We absolutely understand that currently in um, our current environment, the coordination of getting states ready to gear into this process may not be there yet. And that's why we've told states we'll keep you warm, we'll keep you engaged with some of the other activities. But by no matter or means should it be that I've done one so that checks the box, I don't need to do the other. They really are kind of meant to coordinate in a more um, woven way to make sure that folks have kind of uh, executive level, level buy-in for both of these efforts that hopefully will streamline in a way that does not make more work for you, but does eventually bring in more resources. Thank you. Uh, so next couple of questions I think are probably geared for Aaron. Uh, if you see the, the questions here on the data, but I do want to jump over another question from Tim specific to the community engagement partnership coordinators, really trying to understand, um, you know, what the, what the intended roles will be, uh, whether more of a, an oversight role of SPCs, not quite sure what that stands for, uh, or will it be more community engagement focused with local partners? Yeah, and I, I think I answered Tim there, although I have to say I'm not sure I'm mastering the technology. <laughs> um, and that may be in the weeds for folks, but basically SPC is our suicide prevention coordinators. So yeah. Tim is essentially asking where the CEPCs are aligned. At the facility level, they're part of the SPC team, um, but their role is non-clinical. They are entirely focused on community coalition building. So the suicide prevention coordinators do a lot of work now. They go out and do save training and they do outreach in the community. That work continues, but the CEPC's full-time job is to do community coalition work. Awesome, thank you. Could you talk a little bit about how uh, VA is doing the, the, like the research, like where are we getting the, the, the 17, um, 17 per day statistic and yeah, if only if only that was a simple answer, but I'll do I'll do my best here. So that data, I put the link in the chat here. The the 17 veterans per day comes from data that flows from your communities to your states to CDC as part of the National Violent Death Index reporting system. That information eventually comes from CDC to us about 18 months or so after um, about 18 months delayed, something in that range. Our team then with DOD runs that with DOD against their service records to determine veteran status. That has to happen because veteran status reporting um, is either absent 
uh, or less than ideal in many of the um, in many of the death certificates that are reported up. So we want the best possible data uh, and most accurate reporting of veteran deaths. Then that data is run against a number of other sources to deconflict it. This is why essentially you see our data reporting on veteran deaths running about two years behind um, because it's actually incredibly complicated and there's lots of requirements and steps in play to deconflict data, resolve, make sure that we've identified people correctly and veteran status correctly. So it's complex, but there's a team at VA led by Dr. John McCarthy in the Office of mm -hmm. Mental Health and Suicide Prevention who leads that national report. And the 2018 report should be out soon. Excellent. Um, and maybe I'll a follow up on that with a question of my own, just out of curiosity. Maybe this is is more for, maybe more for Liz even with the with the roadmap recommendations around data sharing. You know, like as we're as we're all collectively trying to focus around prevention, uh, maybe both Liz and Aaron, you could talk about like uh, barriers you're trying to overcome with respect to as we engage with community partners, state and local government, uh, specific to data sharing on understanding. Um, you know, gaps in terms of who's accessing services at the community level and, and uh, maybe you could speak to that a little more. Sure, I could talk about it from more of the task force and the federal uh, aspect right now. Uh, so what, what we're doing is we're getting ready to stand up a 90 data action work group and that's bringing in the data uh, subject matter experts from each one of the task force federal agencies as well as data experts outside of the government. So from academia and other non-governmental organizations to help us look at one, what data is out there right now? What type of data ecosystem is required to be built? Uh, many of the uh, lessons learned are from HHS with what they've done with COVID. Uh, and how there's so many barriers to be able to overcome. And so having lessons learned from them to be able to develop this data ecosystem. So we are able to, uh, to leverage all of the information that's out there, but we know that people love holding on to their data. Right? They, they don't want to give that up. Um, and so working with the federal agencies, and that's what's so great about our province task force, is that they're all part of it. And so now we're in the midst of developing those data usage agreements uh, to be able to see what one, what's out there and then how do we have a system that they're able to talk. Um, down at that state and local area, that's when we go down for the state visits. We're asking those questions. What type of data are you, do you all need? What do you currently have? And starting to do that environmental scan and build the repository so then we can help amplify and enhance the efforts. But uh, Aaron, kick it over to you with all that you all are doing maybe with with SP 2.0. Yeah, there's, I mean, Liz is right. There's a lot of complexity here. And I think this is, we, we take some hit as VA, some hits sometimes as VA about our data here in the data report that we issue, but ultimately that's state data. Um, and it's governed by the state reporting to CDC and CDC's agreement about how it rolls up that data. So it took a number of years for us and a lot of data use agreements to put those things into place. But when you're working on national level data, Liz, Liz is finding this work out through prevents. There's a huge amount of complexities um, with who owns that data, what the permissions are, I think the more interesting question for us is really how we move to a place where we're using data proactively. Um, Two-year-old data at a national level and what we refer to as our gold standard data is really useful for understanding big picture over time, but it's not particularly helpful in designing interventions in the short term. And people like Dr. Kim Rep in Washington County, uh, Portland, Oregon, she is the epidemiologist there for the county and supervises the medical examiner's office. She's put a beautiful program into place that I know some states are looking at and some communities are looking at where they do death record review. They have a screening form that the medical examiners use to basically flag a case that needs review. They meet monthly with a group. Every other month they focus on uh, case reviews and they get into depth about those, 
those deaths. The other meeting, they have decision makers from the community, and they've actually been able to intervene in a very timely way on things like hotels in the community where people who have recently been evicted end up and train those hotel clerks to help them recognize people who are in distress. They've worked with the sheriff's office to put mental health resources and professionals out with the teams actually doing evictions in the community so that people are brought in and offered services there. And pretty, I mean, I get chills when I say this, but they were seeing an average of 30 suicide deaths a year related to evictions, and they cut that to a single death in the year after they implemented this program. So we're really interested in VA in working with communities and states about how to act on this information in a timely manner and not wait to see it in a report two years later. That's a great point. I think Tim's got an, another follow-up for you, Aaron, there, just specific to that around the timeliness. Um, but I know we're, uh, we're, we're coming up on time here. This has been a, a fantastic discussion. Uh, I'd like to hand it back to Liz uh, for any reflections or, or parting comments. Yes, thank you so much. I think this has been such an awesome opportunity to really delve deep into what we're doing and how we work together with the, the three different entities. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. If you could please uh, follow us on, this is our social media handles, as well as uh, visit the, the reach.gov. Our hashtag is, is reach now. And uh, we are putting out many different videos, resources, toolkits. Um, and then if there's anything else that you all would like to see, let us know and, and send us an email at, at weareprevents at va.gov. But if you go to the next slide, this is our points of contact. Uh, Karen McDale is our Senior Communications Advisor. Uh, please reach out to her with anything. And then Carolyn Coley is our Action Officer and she is working our ambassador programs. And so if there are any states that would like to nominate a state ambassador, please send that to, to Carolyn and, uh, and we will shoot that forward for approval. Uh, but very excited to be able to, to work with the states that we haven't visited yet. Uh, it's been so impressive of the time that we have spent with the seven states that we visited so far. Thank you for attending this webinar. We're super excited for the next town hall that Dr. Armstrong will then uh, talk a little bit about, but thank you again for, for being part of us and, and being with us throughout these series. Thanks so much, Liz. Uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. On behalf of my colleagues at the Ivy Math, I just want to extend our, our, our continued thanks to Dr. Van Dalen, our guest speakers today, Aaron, Cicely, and Liz, for their leadership and partnership on this critical challenge of preventing suicide. Uh, as you see here from the slide, we're coming back together for a fourth webinar, calling it our town hall. Uh, on November 12th, we're bringing all the principals back uh, to really focus in on the, the questions that you all have, have been posing to us have for, for another great discussion uh, around how we can continue to overcome roadblocks and barriers and, and work together. Uh, as we continue to in advance uh, both the public health campaign and the recommendations put forth in the roadmap. And so with that, I just want to thank you again for attending this webinar. Uh, you will receive follow-ups with the, the slides as, as well as uh, access to the recording on Facebook uh, and, and links back to uh, this, this web website that we've, we've got all this great content hosted. So uh, thank you again and I uh, wish you all a great afternoon. Thank you.